internet. Welcome back at uh, Legacy Partners. I can tell you we have something of a free to battalion old boys club here with us. Uh, but we want to talk about mental health issues. So let me introduce you to our guest. And I want to say to all of you, thank you very much. I'm really grateful for your time and your presence. And I hope to see you again in a future episode. First, we have Kevin Johnson here. You know him. A free to battalion fellow who spoke a lot about his experiences there. Then we have Barton Zanes. He also told us a lot. And now we have Franz J. von Staden. Now, he's actually a psychologist. He's a very smart man, MBA. You, you name it, this guy's got the degrees. And perhaps, Franz, you can begin by explaining yourself uh, where you come from and just a brief background of your time at Free to Battalion so that people can know we're talking to former soldiers here because we're yet to help. Over to you guys. Chris, thank you very much. Um, it's absolute privilege to be here um, today. And uh, moreover, it's a, a wonderful honor to sit with two brothers, um, uh, Kevin and Buttons. We were in three, two, uh, at least the overlap of, of one year, 1982. So um, Kevin, uh, as you may know, was Charlie Company and um, Buttons, you were Foxtrot Company, if I, if I recall correctly. Um, so uh, yes, it's an honor to be here. And Chris, once again, thanks for what, you, what you're doing on the internet and getting us all together uh, from all sides of the conflict. So uh, yes, uh, uh, in brief, uh, uh, a nutshell, um, I uh, matriculated 1980, uh, did my uh, military service 1981, 1982, because at that stage, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And um, then at the end of 1982, I wanted to take another year of short service. And I was told, well, you'll have to wait two or three months to, for us to check whether there's budget. So I, I felt really unwanted at the end of 1982. And um, as they say, if the army doesn't want you, then who really wants you? And then I, I started uh, uh, studying at the only university who wanted to take me at that late stage, that was early 1983, and that was the old uh, Rand Afrikaans University. It was not too far from my home, so I could commute in. And um, I started uh, studying uh, psychology and uh, anthropology as my majors. Um, continued there, started working um, part-time to do my honours, and then uh, was very fortunate to be selected to do my master's degree in counseling psychology. Um, from there, very briefly, I started working because I had to now start earning money from 1991. And um, I, I spent most of my years in corporate life, uh, in human resources, leadership development. But in, through the years, I maintained a pro bono psychology practice uh, to keep my skills home, to keep my foot on the floor, on the ground in terms of developments. And um, my last corporate role was as director for global leadership development at uh, one of the largest banks in South Africa, the Dark Blue Bank. And um, I had to help set up the Global Leadership Center. And thereafter, in uh, early 2008, I had decided to go on my own and to uh, set up my own business and practice. And from there onwards, uh, the plan was to spend one or two years on my own to have some flexibility. Um, and uh, I've had uh, 13 years of uh, blessed experience. Um, my, my work, uh, I focus on specifically, um, uh, obviously, uh, trauma work, acute psychological work, and then uh, executive coaching. I know in some circles that's a swear word, Chris. Um, and um, I also do uh, leadership development and organizational development work in organizations. I, I think that's uh, sufficient for a background. Fantastic. Yeah, Thanks very much, Franz. Yes, sir. So, Franz, if I could ask you a question, you know, you introduced me to this BWRT some months ago. Can you, can you maybe just explain where that originates from and exactly what it's all about? 
Uh, Kevin, um, in the years of, of my private practice, I had the privilege to um, help uh, military veterans from all sides of the struggle, um, whether that was the old SADF, uh, APLA, ZANLA, um, MK, etc. And um, I, I realized that the traditional therapies um, you know, would be really time consuming. You'd sometimes sit for six to eight sessions, sometimes more, and uh, the client would feel good, but you would de know deep in your heart that there wasn't really a shift and that some of the traumas or flashbacks would sometimes recur. And um, I was really uh, privileged in 2017, I came across BWRT, which is called uh, Brain Working Recursive Therapy. It's a therapy that was developed um, by Terence Watts, an amazing person. I hope he gets the Nobel Prize one day for psychology. Um, he hails from the UK, self-trained and self-developed, but an amazing scientist and a very deep thinker. And Terence Watts, um, as he said, stumbled upon BWRT or discovered BWRT through research that he was doing. And um, effectively what, what, what it happened is um, he developed uh, BWRT in 2011. He advanced it, he developed it further. And then there was the the South African um, influence. Uh, Rafik Lockhart, the clinical psychologist on the Cape Flats, an amazing trainer and a role model to me, um, he did the training online um, in 2013. So you can imagine that Terence Watts was, was very, uh, or still is very advanced in, in his use of technology. And Rafik, at the end of the course, um, contacted Terence and said to him, I cannot believe that there's this therapy that is so rapid and permanent uh, with acute uh, trauma and difficulties of, of, of obviously different, different nature. And um, he then started corresponding with Terence and Rafik and Terence started improving on BWRT. So brain working recursive therapy is a really a powerful therapy that I use now mostly in acute traumas with, with uh, the public and military veterans. And we have amazing gobsmacking uh, uh, success with this therapy. So um, the website is www.bwrt.org or the South African website is www bwrtsa.coza. I'd really like um, uh, veterans from all sides to go and look at that. It is an amazingly empowering therapy. Um, and it used to be co uh, called initially contentless therapy. So uh, I really support that. And, and I've had wonderful results with that. And tell me, you know, I just look at my experiences with mental uh, illnesses. I mean, is it chemical? Um, yeah, now, now you're catching me, Kevin. Um, yes, I think it's, it's, it's a combination of that because we, we must understand that the, the, the human is a, is a living system. And sometimes you have causes from all sides um, of, of, of the human. Um, in other words, sometimes it's chemical. There's a, it could be a neurotransmitters or, or it could be a, a, a poisoning through organs that are not working uh, well. Uh, sometimes it is an external uh, event, like a traumatic event, what we are also going to be talking about today. Um, and and um, sometimes it is just a imagination. We must uh, not underestimate the power of the brain to, to uh, visualize something traumatic and then the survival areas of the brain respond as if you are in a, a negative situation. And you can see this often with sportsmen. Um, I know uh, one of our fullbacks in the Springbok team, really uh, struggling at this stage with his game, um, sometimes it is that inner dialogue that we, that we allow ourselves to, to get involved that can often talk ourselves out of the, out of the, 
the game. So, um, yeah, it, it, it has various causes, internal and external, but, and also, therefore, the treatment uh, could be uh, chemical, it could be uh, interpersonal, uh, therapeutic, um, and sometimes in groups. Um, and uh, if you think about it, uh, the, uh, Dr. Rul Skuman, um, hailing from 61 Meg, uh, he did his PhD, and uh, he was doing a lot of work in small groups with men where they are telling this story. So we, we need to look at all the possibilities in terms of, of uh, promoting uh, um, mental health. You know, they, they, they say a lot of people, when they leave the military, they get some form of post-traumatic stress and it can manifest itself in alcohol, drugs, wife beating, depression, anxiety, etc. Now, I want to sh just share a story, what I experienced when it comes to getting anxiety and depression. I left the army. And I suppose because I had a goal and plan clearly in place, I was actually learning the game while I was still at 3-2. So when I landed, boom, I was into the next thing. And I was off to the races, then eventually opened up my own business. And then round about the age of 38, probably about a year after West Bank had bought into the business, I started to get all these weird feelings. So without boring you with the details, the GP eventually put me on to a psychiatrist and he had put me on medication for depression and anxiety. And I went over to the States, came back, and it wasn't working, and landed up in a clinical psychology ward at a private clinic in, in Cape Town, the Libertas. And what I found interesting there was that the nursing sister said to me, oh, you're lucky. Well, go fuck, you know, I'm feeling awful. You're telling me I'm lucky. She said, yes, because normally you go to the floor above where we got to detox you from alcohol or drugs or whatever. And then I realized that obviously a lot of people are probably self-medicating. Fortunately for me, that wasn't the case. So I went straight to that floor below. And um, so the bottom line is I was diagnosed with clinical depression and severe anxiety. And I had to stay in that clinic for 10 days and they gave me cognitive therapy. And fortunately, when I came out, I was on the tablet for about maybe six months, weaning myself off, and probably went to see the psychiatrist once a week for about three months. But anyhow, so I was all fixed up. And one thing I did, because they did hypnosis on me as well, and they went right back into when I was in my mother's womb and came all the way through. And I got quite emotional when I got to the military part because I felt that I was riding the high family, daughter, great business. And then, you know, th people like Stuart and Saltita Runt and that started to like flow out. So I got upset because they were dead. And couldn't we have just, you know, taken what I've got and spread it amongst all of them as well, and they should be alive. But it wasn't a big, big issue. And the funny thing about it is I never ever thought of that until I got ill. So anyhow, so in conclusion, I asked the doctor, there were two of them, what's caused this, you know? And they said, well... The main thing is you're starting to feel better and that's all you must concentrate on. Then my mother said to me one day when I went to see her, she said, when West Bank bought into your business, it's the first time, because I mean, I used to see my mother regularly besides the army days. She said to me, it's the first time in my life that I've seen my son without a goal. And that made me later on in life think, huh, let's say she's true. Let's say she's correct. Then maybe, just maybe, people leave the army 
and they lack a goal. So that was my experience, and thank God, you know, that was 25 years ago. It's never come back. Yeah. Um, Franz, I don't know whether you want to remark on that before I say something. Um, I think what I've found in my, my practice over the years is that um, uh, we all have some or other predisposition um, for example, life events that happened before uh, a military situation. And um, that causes us to respond differently um, and at different stages in our life to, to tra traumatic events or upsetting events. And um, what, I, what I've found is that after the military service, typically you do some studies or you start working and you feel that there's some purpose in in what you are doing and you, you, you know, you, you get into a serious relationship and you start a family and there's a, this purpose and you are building maybe a, a certain income, you, you're getting property and there are signs and trappings of success and wealth and in your social circles. And then I think at, at some stage, something happens. Um, like uh, given what you described, or especially now, you know, at our ages, you know, if you get into the 50s and, and into the 60s, where either, um, you know, if you were in formal employment, that, that means you're in retirement age. Um, if you are in informal employment, uh, maybe your energy level starts waning. And that is the time when um, if you don't have a, a, a final overall life purpose, that that the sort of gremlins start start taking you or the ghosts of the past start popping up. Um, and that is the time when either we the the, the past traumatic events um, affect you. And um, I think that's the time when when we as as veterans need to start looking at ourselves in terms of caring for ourselves. Um, and and uh, to use your words in a few weeks ago, Kevin, it's about building your life bigger and making it bigger than, than the past and sometimes the circumstances that you are in. And do you think yeah. that you know, with people getting um, mentally unwell and that who are ex-military people, do you think that perhaps because so much is said about it that you just assume that when you get unwell that that's the reason? I guess it's quite possible, Kevin. Um, uh, I think uh, we we do make a lot sometimes of of uh, illnesses, but we also need to understand that each person will respond differently. Um, you know, uh, I, I would say that we all have a very individual response to sometimes similar circumstances, and we also interpret that situation differently. Um, if I can, you know, relate uh, some of our experiences in, in the military in Angola, um, if you had a, a tack line that spanned, you know, more than one platoon, um, sometimes the, 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 the guys on the left flank had a totally different experience of the battle than those on the, on the right flank. And that means at the end of the day, it, it is like having two different experiences or two dif different uh, 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 journeys on the day. And um, therefore, we, we, we need to, to be clear that um, coping and dealing with trauma is very individual. And what is traumatic to one person is, is not traumatic to other, another one. Uh, the other aspect, obviously, that, that we need to um, be aware of is vicarious trauma. And that means that the, you know, witnessing the trauma of somebody else, whether you were a, a, a policeman, um, Kevin, or whether you were in emergency medical services, or you, you run a trauma ward, or, or even us um, as military veterans, um, the, the, the fact that we you know, we were aware of Full Stewart and, and Salty and, 
and and Nella and and the, some of our other uh, veterans, the, uh, the, the comrades that we lost in the in the war, that had a, had a, sometimes a, a bigger impact on on being injured yourself. Um, and I think we need to understand that individual response. Yeah, I think um, if I can just come in here, I think for, for me, it was a little bit different uh, for us because I left the military when I was quite senior and I spent a little bit more time there. But I think what uh, impacted me in a sense was that um, when I resigned, I um, didn't have a actual plan what to do but and the reason then I uh, took a year off and I toured the country but I had some idea what to do but what um, bothered me was that um, to find something now as a replacement of what I was doing and um, you must remember I started uh, studying first and then I went to the defense force and I couldn't see myself um, going back to study at that specific stage. Um, although, I, although I tried, I did a, a honors in, uh, in labor relations at RIE, um, but I didn't uh, practice in that. But it's a question of uh, a sort of a numbness. I think there's a, there's a situation that you build up to and that you've achieved certain goals in your life and now suddenly you have to start from scratch in civilian life. And uh, not everybody is aware of what you did, but uh, so the type of, uh, say, attention or recognition that you're getting now is, is, is much less than that, what you have had. And I think that sort of built up to a fact that I continuously had a sort of a wanderlust um, at myself. So every 10 years or so, I, I was totally fed up with what I was doing, although I did well in everything that I did. But then totally started totally different uh, career. Um, and I, I've done that four times in my life already. Um, and maybe to find now in my last few years that, uh, that I'm doing what I'm actually, what I love to do and I like it. It's uh, maybe not always uh, financially rewarding, but it's it's definitely personally for me, it's rewarding. So for me, the, the trauma that I sort of felt I had is that I, there was two, it was either a fight or flight situation for me. Um, but in the flight situation, there was a sense that I would just go quiet and not talk to anybody, not mingle with anybody. Um, not even talk to my wife or my children for long periods of time. But on the other hand, um, confrontation, I like to have confrontation. It got really bad at some stage in my life that, that I was, uh, so my hands were actually cuffed and I couldn't, I was uh, sort of, there was a, uh, how do they say, uh, a clamp on your hands, if you do uh, get into a fight again, it would be a, a, a sentence and you would go to jail. It, um, and I don't know why I did it, but it was the sense of that, uh, maybe some of the traumas that one had in, in the military. So I would, for instance, go into a, into a restaurant with my wife and my children, and I would immediately psych out or check out everybody in there and start a sort of a, a conversation with myself and uh, sort of visualizing a, a physical confrontation with some of the people that, that I looked at and didn't like. So I had a preconditioned idea of them already and I knew that um, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna have some trouble with them. Or I would go into situations where I, I was totally outnumbered and I would uh, try and take on that challenge to say, okay, I'll take on six people. I'll go to their table, sort them out. But, but in such a manner that they didn't dare to stand up. And my, obviously that was not a good experience for my children and my wife. But um, obviously, luckily, <clears throat> that passed 
And uh, whether so what age did that go on top? Yeah, not uh, about ten years ago. Mm. So it so, started uh, there. So it started there that night at Buffalo, where we had to handcuff him there at the hospital, <laughs> so that he didn't pull no, the drug maybe, out. That was maybe the trigger, but uh, huh? I'm not sure. But that is the type of uh, thing that happens to me, or happened to me, in the sense that if somebody does offend my family, I would, I would not. Uh, bother to 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 sort them out immediately um even to such a stage that i will sometimes end up in a fight and then take individually out one of those guys and pull them to my table and tell them to ask forgiveness or to each of my family members you know it was uh, it was bad at, at some stage so i did come over that i mean um obviously because of faith as well, but also uh, realizing later on that uh, you can't continue doing this because it's it's just not good behavior and it's just not uh, it's just not on. But I think it's a question of uh, it was either keeping up or keeping in the aggression for too long, and then. Um, uh, if it does boil over, it's it's a it's a it's a bad business. I still find myself walking into a into a restaurant or a building, and uh, already looking for the escape route if anything happens. It's, it's funny that you that you still have those drills in your in your mm -hmm. mind. Uh, even uh, when I still used to live in in, in Pretoria, um, I used to have my family keep stay in the car. And I'll sort of go through the house and go around the house first, that type of attitude. So it's principles and drills that were that were in you that's not no, not necessarily um, acceptable in, in in normal life. And uh, I think the only way you can handle that is, or in certain circumstances, you fall back on what you know. Um, yeah, that's maybe my my experience. I didn't get any help for it. Uh, Obviously, there was also stages uh, of heavy drinking, um, but uh, by the grace of God, I got over that, and uh, I think I'm quite normal now. Although um, not a person that would uh, befriend a lot of people, because I think there's also a precondition on who you want to have your, as your friends, because of the type of work you did. No, you're right there. Well, at least that night at Buffalo, you had friends, because, I mean, we handcuffed you to make sure yeah. you didn't pull the drops out and all of that. So, I mean, we were really nurturing and caring you. Um, Thank you. I appreciate and, that. Uh, when we went back to the pub, we thought to ourselves, oh, God, do we have a Malachi here that's now joined us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's... Uh, I could feel it, yes. Yeah. So... It, so tell me, Franz, uh, so thanks for that, Buttons. Tell me, Franz, why, why in this modern world of ours today is there still so much emphasis? In other words, the physical exercises are still heavily weighted big time. And whilst it's improving on the mental side, it's still pretty low down compared to, you know, if you look at all the ads and everything that goes on around exercising. Kevin, I, I think I'm, I'm very curious about this story with the handcuffs. So uh, if you promise me that we'll go back to that, um, then, then I, I will carry on with this one. Well, um, just quickly, I, was, I wasn't a big drinker, but that particular night, I think I'd had a much, too much to drink. So I just heard the story next day. That uh, Buttons can actually tell the story because... You know, he he was there. <laughs> so maybe buttons. You need to share the story out all where it all began and where it all ended. Man, it began with um, we came out of the training area um, and we were pulled out there um, before the rest of the training and the orientation was done. So Jasper and myself, who was also a little. Uh, uh, 
would be boxer. I think he should have been a lightweight boxer in his previous life, or could have been. And um, yeah, now you're not a CEO, you're not a Lance Corporal, you don't know where you fit in, but eventually we ended up in the NCO's bar because we knew a few guys there. Um, like Barry from Maryland was, was at school with me, was a few years behind me. And there were one or two guys that I knew. So it was myself, Bucks. Jasper claims he wasn't there. Yes. He said he had malaria, but not so sure about that. He's also can't always remember everything. But it was myself and Bucks and Rasmus. And then I, obviously, alcohol was involved. And uh, there was an argument or two. And uh, me being the senior in years thought that would also uh, count there in the bar, which it didn't. Um, and uh, I made a remark that uh, something like, uh, you were my shot when, when I was matriculating. So, and now you want to come and tell me a story. So it ended up me being uh, given a proper hiding. Um, and I ended up in the hospital. I was strapped in there. Obviously, a little bit of injury. And the next day, I was thrown into the DB. Um, yeah, and that's how, how my uh, start of 3 to Battalion wake a rudening, or a rude awakening. <laughs> so, yeah, that is the gist of the story. I don't know exactly who was all involved. I, I might, I've got my ideas. Kevin might have slipped some day. Yeah, but eventually it uh, turned out all well and it's not a thing that you linger on. So that's the story. I, I don't know what's the it one. Was, it did. was just a bit of love being given out. You know, we just wanted to get, put this guy in a sort of a course direction. We didn't want him to like spoil his time at 3-2. So we thought, look here, he's a bit cocky. So what he needs to do is he needs to get some punishment and the punishment must be for future misdemeanors as well. So in other words, what he did is he got it in advance. Yeah. And I mean, they after he was a wonderful man. Yes. Thank you very and much. As for his partner in crime, Jasper, well, I mean, we'll probably need about 10 zoom sessions to talk about Jasper. Yeah, no, that's another story. <laughs> or two. Jasper was probably doing a recon there on the nursing sisters oh, while my. you were being blitzed. <laughs> also trauma there. <laughs> so maybe I can ask you another question, Franz. Um, I just heard over the news uh, yesterday, actually, that uh, at the moment... Um, the suicide count for Namibia is the highest that it's ever been. And uh, it's like four or five people per day. And which you must remember, Namibia is a very small number. Of, the population is very low. And most of them are men. And uh, I, I did a few sessions with people uh, right in the beginning and in the middle of, of, uh, of COVID where a husband and wife with small children, they, they didn't know how to cope with their children 24-7 at home. And uh, obviously the other thing that's happening or that had happened during COVID was the situation that people lose their jobs and they, they aren't the, the father figure or the man figure in the, in the house anymore. They can't look after the house. They got dead and they just can't take it anymore. Um, and they either go into depression or do something, uh, take their lives. So it's also, I think nowadays, very re relevant uh, that one think about this in the sense that there's a lot of people out there struggling. And I also think if you get to our age and um, some of the ex-military people that has uh, now lost their jobs or uh, gone redundant or been retrenched 
it's a quite a big shock for people. And it's also a, 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 a lot of stress on you and uh, and people don't know how to handle it. And it, that's just like a dark hole that you go into and you don't know how to do and what to do. Yeah, we, we, we're sitting with currently with uh, multifaceted uh, problems that that contribute to obviously the impact on on mental health um, buttons. Um, you know, if you if you just think of the global responses to COVID nineteen and and um, the fact that uh, government responses in all the countries or most of the countries, you know, were severe, suddenly you lost the right to go out uh, in a public space, especially when the lockdown levels were high, um, or if you if you wanted to go into a public space, you had to wear a mask, you had to you had to do things that you weren't used to in the past. Um, you know, we've got the, the whole uh, debate between the vaxxers and the anti-vaxxers and all the fake news and conspiracy news that is coming through that is uh, filling our minds. And, and nowadays we are so exposed to, to all the social media. Um, uh, you know, my children are exposed to some other social justice thing happening in a country that they almost haven't thought of. And now it's top of mind on, on YouTube and all the other social media platforms. Um, you know, on top of, of COVID, we still have the accidents and the heart disease and all the other, you know, uh, lifestyle in, uh, illnesses and, and stress. Um, you know, South Africa specifically, and I guess maybe to some extent, Namibia also has that socioeconomical and political landscape. Um, you know, that, that is uncertain. Um, we've just had, uh, you know, local government uh, elections um, and, and one is wondering what, you know, how will the, will the various uh, parties execute on their promises? We still have the, you know, concerns around safety. So there are lots of stresses. And then we've got this collective anxiety and fear, you know, uh, sometimes fueled by fake news and people posting uh, you know topics on that haven't been properly researched on social media so so um, and then coupled with all of that we still have performance targets at work um, or you know after the looting some companies were still expected to deliver you know on their on their targets so and on top of that, we still have the historical matters of, of past traumas, etc. So, um, uh, suicide amongst men is is more prevalent, uh, and I think it's partially because the way in which we were socialized, in especially certain certain cultures and communities, in in terms of cowboys or boys don't cry for that matter, um, you know if. If you want to cry, let me give you something to cry about. You know, if you think of some of the parenting styles, um, and I think uh, uh, men and uh, I'm stereotypical here, but men typically like with color. Uh, we we cannot access that range of emotions. You know, if if I ask uh, my dear wife now, you know, or I t t try to describe a certain color to her. You know, then I'll say, no, it's like maroon or pink or something. And then she'll say, no, it's mauve and crimson or whatever words I've never heard about. And I think that is the, the range of emotions often that, that, that uh, traditionally women in society can access. So, so I think the, the more nuanced emotions like rejection or loneliness or or, or, or feeling sometimes that you've lost your purpose. It's very difficult for us to, to name the granular emotion as men because of the way that we were socialized. We, there are usually, you know, a finite number of emotions that we tend to gravitate to, you know, and, and, and I know, forgive me, uh, sometimes I, I may be stereotypical here, but um, it, is, it is often... Uh, uh, you know, emotions like anger and, and anticipation and joy and, and, and love and lust and, 
you know, uh, the other ones we struggle to deal with. So, yeah, it is a, a fact that we sometimes can't, cannot name what we deeply feel. And the fact that we sometimes assume that we will be judged if we, if we show some form of weakness in some societies. Um, and uh, just to, to, to connect with your, your stats as well, Buttons, um, the South African Depression and Anxiety Group has also had, I think, almost a fourfold increase in the number of calls that have come into their helpline um, in the past, I guess, year or so. So it is that the anxiety is raising, but I think we don't always have the coping skills as men to deal with that range of emotions that that are not always that easy to, to name and then um, uh, deal with. So I think the one of the coping skills is for us to go and look at, um, you know, for example, Plutchik's Wheel of Emotions, and it's just one of the wheels that's available on the internet. And, and of course, I have a picture if you want to, if you want to post it at, at the later stage, but where we, we can just think about all, all the emotions and ask ourselves, what am I feeling? Or what have I been feeling over the past 18 months? And then once I at least give it a name, then I can start the, the process of coping with it. Um, Kevin, if I just can come to that, that uh, comment also, or the question around exercise, you know, um, our brains and uh, and and the, the the middle part of the brain, which we some call it the limbic system or the mammalian complex, um, is also the area that that has a huge impact on our emotions and and memory and 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 so on. And and anxiety is typically a, a emotion that we experience or a feeling that we have that comes almost from a visceral experience. So it comes from the inside. It's the part of your brain that says, you know what, there's some change happening in my life. I'm now I'm creating an anxiety level in my human so that the awareness levels are raised and that the person then can be more alert in coping with change, whether that's inner change or whether that is external change. Now, um, there, there are a few easy ways to deal with anxiety. One is good and one is bad. One is good, good is exercise. It helps to run your heart rate. It runs to, uh, helps to just almost refresh the system, helps the lymph system to, to actually almost clean itself. And, and that increased heart rate obviously is very good for your cardiovascular and pulmonary health. Then the other one that works very well for anxiety is eating. And um, that is not necessarily a good, is not a good uh, coping mechanism. Um, on the contrary, it, uh, it does have a huge impact on the health of people. So I would always support um, exercise. However, sometimes very fit people um, could be depressed, but the fitness and the routine of exercise, sometimes masks, the, if they move into a state of depression where there's possibly a chemical imbalance in the brain, uh, but they, 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 through their habits, they, they keep on exercising and, and therefore we don't often identify the depression um, early in, 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 the, in the process. Oh, that's good. So, Frond, maybe what I'd like to do is just share some of the things that you showed me and that what you discussed with me. So basically, um, I, I approached France and said, look here, I've invested into young people in a new business. So, you know, you've got to get back into the basics and into the trench and that because I'm not a passive investor. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to lift my ambition because obviously having that two previous businesses that were successful, you get into a bit of a comfort zone. So basically, France then took me through that uh, B E W R T. But what I want to just share, France, and then you can elaborate on this, is what I found very, very helpful were the addressing the imposter syndrome. 
Um, and then also, I must say, I've made a conscientious effort to stay in the right circle rather than that other circle of concern. And what I find is it definitely relaxes you more, you can focus more, you've got more energy by utilizing those circles correctly. So, you know, maybe if you could maybe just as a professional, you know, share with the audience what that actually is all about. The yes. imposter syndrome is, is um, in my way of describing it, it's, it's often um, where a person is an achiever to the, uh, to the outside, um, has often worked hard to, to build a career or be successful in, a, in an area, but there's often what we would call the inner dialogue. And I, I referred to that earlier as well, but it's a, it's a powerful inner voice uh, in the way that you look at yourself, your self-identity, um, the way that you would describe yourself in, uh, you know, when you're thinking about yourself, the way that you look at yourself in, in the mirror. And, and often um, people maintain a, a negative inner dialogue about themselves, which means that even in situations where they are achieving, they are successful, they are doing uh, they're contributing to society that is that that part of the brain that or the inner dialogue as i said that that causes you to think that you are that you have feet of clay um, and and being aware of that and and starting to deal with that is very important um, because if not then um, you can think yourself you know uh, out of the game and, and, and that's the game of life. It can be sports or it can be in your career. So if you are saying to yourself, you know what, I have achieved a certain position or I've received, uh, achieved certain results, but I'm not comfortable in my mind with what I have achieved and I'm not, I don't have a positive identity, then I will always feel that, that I, I short or I, I have a, a lack of, of, of uh, something in me, um, which takes us then to, to how do you uh, deal with that? And, and it's, it's really a, a journey of, of being aware of resilience um, and, and what builds resilience. And on the other side, also be very conscious of self-care. Um, and what I, what I mean with self-care is, is, the fact that you need to say that I need to first and foremost look after myself. I need to take almost in a self, uh, um, uh, selfish way, take part in certain activities that fill my cup. Um, and in other words, though, those activities that will, will uh, make me feel healthy, that will make me feel good, and then at the same time avoiding those activities that could drain your cup or the people that sometimes drain your cup. And you know of situations or activities that where almost you sometimes are in the flow. In other words, you forget about time or you, you walk out of a situation feeling refreshed and, and almost, you know, like I have with uh, one of my three, two mates. Uh, I don't have his permission to use his name, but uh, who's, who lives in the U.S., but whenever we connect within the first few minutes, we have deep belly laughs. And sometimes my, my, my ribs are painful after a 10 or 15 minute conversation with him. You need to ensure that you, you find those situations. And then you find, need to avoid those people that really drag you down, that are, that are always um, seeing the glasses half, em half empty. But I think the, the next part is that uh, what you referred to is the work done by Stephen Covey and Viktor Frankl. Stephen Covey um, wrote the book called The Seven Habits uh, of Highly Effective People. His son, after uh, Steve's, Steve's death, his son has continued with the business. Um, and Viktor Frankl has written the books on man's search for meaning um, and the logotherapy work. Um, and, and obviously he brings that experience um, uh, as a professional, a mental health professional from being in, in one of the Nazi death camps. And, and basically what, what Covey has done, 
as he has said, we need to look at the two circles in our life. The circle of influence, or some people would call it the circle of control. Those are the things that you can do something about in life. Um, if it bothers you, I can do something about. That is the, the social media that I consume. Um, the, the, what I allow into my mouth, my body, my mind, my spirit, um, and into my relationships. So those are the things that we can do something about. Um, how I think about myself, how I react to situations or rather respond to situations rather than just react because react is a fight, flight, freeze, flop um, reaction. Um, and then the other circle is the circle of concern. Now, the circle of concern is the danger for us nowadays. And those are the things that really make us very tired and exhausted because we cannot do something about it. So I'm a believer. So I believe that the circle of influence, that's France's list. Those are the things that France needs to do to keep himself healthy. The circle of concern, that's God's list. Those are the things that I need to move from France's list onto God's list or my prayer list to say, I cannot do something about it. Let me take a situation of general crime um, in, in any situations. Um, so circle of con uh, influence or, or control is what I'm going to do about crime. I'm going to report uh, crime. I'm going to avoid crime. I'm not going to buy things that fell off a track, truck that are, you know, being offered at a very special price. I'm not going to look away in situations where there's a possibility of, of, of a criminal process. I'm going to join the community policing forum, for example, in South Africa at the different um, uh, 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 precincts or, or, uh, or um, suburbs. And, and I'm going to not buy, uh, let's say, cheap DVDs at traffic lights because they are all part of, of organized crime. What is in the circle of, uh, of concern when it comes to crime? It's that general feeling of, of that, you know, I can't do something about this situation. It's that anxiety that I cannot do something about. So what we are saying is focus your energy on the things that you can do. Ensure that you and your family are safe when you are driving, especially in, in South African cities, then you don't talk on your mobile phone. You don't... Um, you are aware when you stop at an intersection because of, unfortunately, the hijackings and the smash and grabbing that, that happens in some intersections. So um, that is the circle of influence and circle of concern. And um, it's accessible on Professor Google. So please go and, and look at that because that is one aspect that has a huge impact on, on, on our mental health as as people in general, but also now the veterans. You know, when you, you shared those two circles with me, I've had some things in place, you know, in terms of being productive and using my time correctly. But when you mentioned those two circles to me, I made a conscientious effort to stay more in the one. And as you rightly said, you give the other circle to God. And what I find is that, by staying in that circle of control, I'm not just more focused, okay? What I find is I'm actually more creative as well. And as a businessman, you know, creativity is obviously important. Very true. Um, I, I think you also see that there's some results from your actions. Because I think the, 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 I think one of the worst things is to know that you've exhausted yourself at a certain activity or pursuit and there's no outcome. Um, I think that that ties you out. And I think there were some events sometimes that in the army as well, we felt like it's never going to be the end of the day. You know, when the corporals were running and you were doing exercises and as they call it, uh, night noises or nachelader, we, um, the only noises you heard was the guy vomit, vomiting next to you from exhaustion. You know, if you're in those situations where people 
create the impression like, you know, this day is never going to end and you allow yourself to get into that situation. That's when, when you, you finding the, the, the situation traumatic. But if you know, like, you know what, sometime we have to have dinner and this is going to be maybe a half an hour, an hour from now. And you're just holding on, putting the one foot in front of the other. Then, then, then you're in a better uh, mind space. So mm -hmm. never underestimate the power of our minds to get us into a state of mental health or, or, or mental, mental illness or, or, or disease. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So just one other... Go on. No, carry on. Yeah, so just one more question from me because we've just gone over the hour now. So Franz, you know, they make reference to these two little things that look like almonds, the amygdalas. And when I read up some of that stuff on the BWRT, on Terence's website, I saw reference to it, you know, the amygdala. So they'd say, is that the anxiety box? So what would you say is the top three trips? Besides the good stuff you shared with us, what would be your sort of top three things that people need to be mindful of when it comes to the amygdalas? I think we need to know that in our, in our midbrain, the limbic system, and again, of course, I've got a picture if you want to post it there. Um, uh, and then that's the blue, blue area on this picture. That area is the area of our memories and it's the area of our emotion. And that's the area that makes mammals of us. Now, um, uh, below that is the brainstem. It's the red area on the picture. And that's the area that is unconscious at all times. Well, with the blue area, the, the limbic system. And runs almost like software automatically when we are in different situations. Now, the, the red area, which is the brainstem and runs down to the coccyx, which is the central nervous system down your spine, that controls all your, um, all your uh, uh, bodily functions, your organs, etc. Now, remember, that area is like an omnipotent idiot. Uh, and, and I say that with respect because... If that thing starts, part of your brain starts running, or they some call it, although the word work by poor, just the polyvagal area, that that it, 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 that area takes its cues from what the human is thinking, or what is happening in the in the sensory area. In other words, the five senses. So what happens typically, and that's a simple process, and we can uh, talk about that at the at the later stage again if you want. But our five senses, as we are sitting here, scan the environment, okay? And then the data comes in at a conscious level, and that gets matched in the amygdala area, the hippocampus, um, the thalamus, and, 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 and some of the areas of the midbrain. But that's automatic. That's like the software under the keyboard of your laptop. It's like a virus software. So the moment that, that the data comes in, you as a human is not aware of it. That's because remember the consciousness sits in the green area in that picture, uh, the new cortex or the uh, um, primate complex, etc. So what happens? The data comes in at an unconscious level. Your brain matches it with, is it safe? Is it unsafe? Um, am, I, am I not sure? Um, and then if it's safe, you don't even think about it. If it's unsafe, then you run that immediate that fight, flight, freeze, flop response. Even if it's perceived um, a danger. Uh, and, and then remember, you are predisposed because of your memories that you already have certain assumptions about some situations. And then what they call is the amygdala hijack happens. In other words, the amygdala is the center of emotions. And that immediately gives you, uh, it, it immediately goes down to the, to the red area, which is the, limb, uh, the, the, the brain stem. And you have higher heart rate, adrenal secretion, and you get into that, that mode of fight, flight, freeze, flop. Um, and, and then by the uh, only a third to a half a second and sometimes longer, does the conscious mind become aware of what's happening. And by that time, you already have that almost tightness in the chest, the sweating, the anxiety, the heart rate. And what do you say to yourself? Well, then I must be stressed. And 
then I feel stressed. And then only can your, your conscious brain kick in by, by doing things like box breathing, visualization of a better situation, or then investigating the situation to say, is it really dangerous or not? Um, uh, I, I've had one of my clients is a, a massive sort of rugby player, a, a lookalike, walked into my office one day and I said to myself, um, you know what, this guy doesn't really want to be here. He, he was um, a victim of two armed robberies. And I said to myself quietly, Franz, if you screw up today, you're going to be donor. Now, donor is a good way of saying you're going to be beaten. And um, what happened to him and what caused him to come and see me? Because typically, like many veterans and, and uh, macho men, um, he felt that he didn't need the psychologist. But after the, the two armed robberies that occurred within one week, he um, walked in a shopping center. And the next moment, he found himself in a fetal position. So that was the position that he was in in the second armed robbery when he was physically injured by, by four, four robbers. And this is typically what happens to you. When the amygdala hijack uh, happens, it's because there's some data that came in that he associated in his uh, limbic system with the attack. And that caused him then to, to have the fight, flight, freeze, flop experience. So... Um, that is, in, in a nutshell, the, the, the amygdala hijack. Um, and that's where, with BWRT, we, we work in the, in the midbrain or the limbic system to try to remove some of those upsetting memories that tend to trigger us. And now, um, Batson, you've spoken earlier about the triggers that you have when you're in a restaurant. That is typically what happens at the, at the, at the unconscious level where you, you go into that fight, flight, free, freeze, flop mode. Um, and that is the amygdala hijack in a nutshell. But Franz, yeah. if I may ask a question here. When I was working in counterterrorism, and I don't want to explain what exactly what I did or didn't do, we had a female agent who got captured and most foully abused until we could get out, actually she escaped, and we could move in, and we took revenge. But since then, she was acting a bit strange. And she would, for instance, and I don't know how this came to be, but for, but for some joke, somebody tried to put something over her head, like a pillow. And she went beyond belief, it became so violent that we almost had to shoot her for her own good. So what I'm asking you is, would it be a good thing that's like, you know, you've fallen off a horse, now get on the horse again. Is that at all applicable here? Is it possible if we put the pillow again on her head that she'll be better? That, that technique, um, of course, is, is called flooding. Um, and and um, I even used to do things like that um, to some of my clients in the past, where you take them back into an upsetting situation and you keep them there and you help to them to reassure themselves and you help to reassure them that they are safe. And eventually the, 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 the calming part of the brain uh, starts um, just the parasympathetic system starts calming down and then you do, you know, uh, uh, improve from that and that is still uh, in some cases an accepted uh, therapy um, uh, but typically what happened with her is, is she went into fight flight freeze flop and I think there are less traumatic therapies available nowadays to deal with that but it's no wonder that she, she, she attacked you because she went back into as if she was back in, in, in that situation of being captured and the brain responds because remember, the, the, the brain stem and the mammalian areas, again, the blue and the red areas on that picture, um, take over. And the, the conscious thinking brain, the, the clever part of the brain, which is the prefrontal cortex and the neocortex or the, 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 the one with the, all the rimples, um, that part of the brain um, is, is almost shut off for a, for a period. 
until uh, you know uh, some time has passed, and that varies sometimes from individual to individual. Yeah, I, Franz, thank you. Um, I was just thinking that you're talking about the circle of influence now, and uh, it reminded me that, uh, for instance, when I lost my oldest son, um, I, I, I sort of um, went to into, into a mode that I didn't, I, I, I was really depressed. And, uh, and the way that I got out of it was actually by, by my wife um, telling me to uh, work in the circle of influence and then decide um, what you can control and what you can't control. For instance, um, she made me um, wake up a normal time as I used to normally um, dress or first go for my physical education or physical training, then come back and have a cup of coffee and then dress. And then she, she set up an office for me at home. And then I must go into the office and, and get into a circle of, of a normal routine again. And, um, and it's a question of, um, yeah, the way you feel this is also the way you think it's also the way you behave. And, and when you're really dark, um, you go to that point in, that you, you don't actually know what to do. But if you go back to your circle of influence, then it helps. And I mean, I've also, also seen it now recently. I mean, I lost my mother and my grand, uh, my mother-in-law in a question of two weeks now. Um, if I hadn't had that previous experience um, of, of doing and controlling and, 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 and concentrating on things that I can actually have control over, um, it would have been uh, much, much more difficult. To give you an example, having gone through my mother's experience now, um, and she was a leader in our, in our, in our lives and uh, somebody to look up to, and I had three or four weeks where I had to sort out her um, a, a sort of a, a state. Luckily, she was a very organized person. And uh, just two weeks after that, my mother-in-law died. And it's a question that you could go through that experience again, and you could, you could keep control, you could, you, you could keep calm, um, because you've had that experience, you've, you've, you've learned something from that, and now you have, you have the behavior that you can, that can apply to that. Um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, it was quite refreshing to hear about the circle of influence, which which one, which one does, but not uh, always concentrate on. You, you tend to sort of fluctuate and fall around, but you have to make a conscious decision about what can you control and what not. Um, but that's my, yeah, my condolences with your losses. And um, uh, yeah, I, I'm glad that um, you developed that previous coping skill um, to be able to apply because often we go to coping skills that we developed um, and because they worked in the past, we validate that, that behavior. Uh, uh, you know, just in some situations that that coping skill may not work, but in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that it, it worked for you. And um, yeah, I know that you have a very clever wife, wife. So um, uh, yeah, just pass on my greetings to her. Um, yeah, just a, a last comment. I think we've touched on, on the matter of trauma. Um, uh, just a disclaimer, you know, I know there are very clever people on this channel, um, of course, and um, I just want to say I try to keep this simple. I, I may have made some uh, academic errors, and I'm always open for criticism or ways to improve, uh, but this has been my understanding of, of the world that we've been working in, and it's been an absolute uh, privilege to be um, on this channel, Chris, and then um, Kevin and Buttons, thank you. It was great to, to rub shoulders with you again, even if it's, uh, if it's uh, electronic and digital. Yeah, it was nice. Franz, Franz, if I can just on a more lighter note ask you a question. I, I was always intrigued. So there, Buffalo, I got into trouble. So I got marched in there by P.V. van Joden to see Big Daddy. And I said to myself, and I, I shared this in another video, that I said to myself, this guy's not going to intimidate me. 
because I knew I was in trouble. But when I came to a halt and I stood there, my calf started to vibrate like you can't believe. What the hell was going on in my head that made that calf vibrate? <laughs> Kevin, if I was on orders in front of Big Daddy, more than my one calf would vibrate. I <laughs> look, we had the world of respect for him. I only worked with him in Opsiskari, but um, you know, I heard from uh, you know the guys who were with him. Um, when he was 2IC of the unit and, and obviously from 83 onwards, that uh, everybody ha has, still has the world of respect for him. So I, I cannot declare that, but I'm telling you, more than my calf would have vibrated at that moment. So my attack wasn't too bad. Uh, yeah. There we go. Well, well over to you, Chris. You know, I'm feeling sorry for myself here because I have to interview this big daddy of yours. <laughs> I wonder what's going to vibrate for him, perhaps my voice or something. But I would, I would like to ask you all of you a, a, a general question. If you, our listeners are mostly former veterans or our veterans, former soldiers, is it shameful to ask for help if you know something is wrong with you? Franz, would you first say it's unmanly, that there's something, you know, that you some become a sissy boy or something, and I don't mean it in a derogative way. If, um, of course, if, if veterans and, and people in society generally would, would just ask for help, I really see that as a big step, and it's the most difficult step of, of getting help, because... Um, you know, uh, if, if they just take that step, I often, you know, get some inquiries and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, if it's a, it's a matter of finances, it's, it's not an issue. Um, you can get help, um, but just take that first step. Um, obviously, um, and I'm, I'm, I also want to say this, and I don't want to keep people away, but the, we've, I've also had my fair share of bullshitters over the years. You know, people who want to come in, tell this story, which you then realize, you know, they added a few tales to the story. Um, uh, the, the type of therapy that I, I prefer to do, and it's not the only one, um, we don't need to tell the story. We just go in and we get working immediately on, on the issue, um, without having to disclose, um, but it's a sense of, of courage and, and of bravery if you ask for help. Yeah, I can maybe say that I think uh, it's maybe basic, like Fran said previously, it's, 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 the, it's the social structure as well and um, how we think about men. But I think... Um, to, to take the first step is, is, is very important. And uh, I can maybe compare it to debt. So they're really deep in debt. Sometimes you get to a point that you don't actually know what to do and how to solve it. But mostly there's still very good people in life. And you can then, if you do talk to them, there's always a solution because you get so black that you don't know how to solve this problem you're looking at the problem you're not looking at the solution and i think it's the same with with uh, depression and with mental health that you have to take the step and it's not necessarily um that the point i want to make is you you also have to be able to see yourself as vulnerable and i think that's maybe the step that some people can't take because they can't see themselves as vulnerable but if they do take that step, there's more light than darkness at the end of that tunnel. Well, from my side, it hit me very hard. So in a way, I was forced to get help. But I will say one thing, that when I was well before I got ill, and then I came out the other side, and over a fact, I came out the other side a better person. Yeah. That's true. Gentlemen, I have to thank you 
I must tell you, I was a bit skeptical when we started this. And I think I was wrong. I think what should happen is if you have a problem, if you know there's something wrong with you, go to France or go to wherever you can get assistance. You're not alone. There's no need for you to, to suffer alone. And I want to get away from that stigma that there's something unmanly about asking for assistance. There's nothing unmanly. It takes, it takes guts actually to say there's something wrong. So now that we're at the end of this particular program, and there will be many more, and I will ask you to leave your comments below and also to look at the links where you can reach France and you can reach other people. If you have comments and you want to discuss a specific topic, please just leave them below. We will look at it. And if possible, we will carry on with it in the next one. I also have to say to you from a legal viewpoint, this is an informative session, right? And I'm going to put up a legal disclaimer here as well. You cannot sue us if you acted upon our advice just here from the side without going to a real expert like France, and then something happens with you. So let's just get this clear. This is informational. It's not supposed to be medical advice or anything else like that. Shall I ask you, Kevin, first, and then Buttons, and then France can end? Do you have any last uh, thoughts or ideas? Well, my, my, my one line, now that I'm 64 and I've been doing it for a long time, is, you know, always make your future bigger than your past. That's my one-liner. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, well, I would say that, uh, yeah, it's the way you feel, it's the way you think, it's the way you behave. So feel, if you feel good, you'll, you'll think about it and you will behave proper. I think we all come from different walks of life and we've all had different experiences. And regardless of which traumas you suffered, whether in civilian life or military or police or EMS, um, there is help available. And um, your current um, financial circumstances don't, shouldn't keep you from, from getting help. Um, I, I'm always available. I've been available to, to um, veterans from all sides of the Southern African and African struggle. And I remain available. So... Uh, uh, my contact details will, will be on the video, of course. Uh, Chris, to you, thank you very much. And Kevin and Buttons, it's a wonderful privilege to, to have her up shoulder, shoulders with you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Good day. Thanks. Then to all of you, I would say again, once again, thank you for all of you who are listening here. And uh, until we meet again, God bless.